Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, the Executive Director of the New Democracy Foundation, Ian Walker, Political Editor of the Australian Financial Review, Laura Tingle, American writer and visiting fellow at the Lowy Institute, James Fallows. Author, George Megalogenis, whose quarterly essay argues political inertia is putting Australia's prosperity at risk. And broadcaster and journalist turned state cabinet minister, Prue Goward. Please welcome our panel. Thank you, and you can watch Q&A live across Australia on ABC TV and ABC News 24 and listen on News Radio. Well, tomorrow all eyes will be on the Parliament as the Federal Treasurer delivers his first budget, setting the agenda for the nation and for the forthcoming election. Tonight we're asking whether our political system is really capable of delivering the policies and reform we need. We'll go straight to our first question. It's from Greg Vaines. Thanks, Tony. After years of positive economic growth, I'm worried that Australia has become a complacent country and that without significant economic reform, we will inevitably head into recession. The Hawke-Keating era, as well as the early years of the Howard government, saw significant e economic reform, but since the introduction of the GST in 2000, there have been minimal significant reforms. In fact, none come to mind. What has to be done to get our political leaders to lead the country and make the tough decisions so that we avoid a major economic recession. George, we'll start with you. That's a big question, Greg, and that's been the problem for the last uh, 25 years. You could pretty much break down the uh, 25 years of uninterrupted growth into three very distinct sections. So <coughs> payoff from the 80s and 90s, we sort of would take you out to the turn of the 21st century. Then we had a mining boom that got us going, uh, almost like a second wind uh, that we didn't really expect or ask for, but spent. And more recently, the only thing that's keeping the economy growing is overseas migration and the property markets of Sydney and Melbourne. That's really the only activity we've got left in the place. The mining boom peaked in about 2011. And you allude to the problems in the political system. We've had some big reforms attempted, uh, going all the way back to John Howard with work choices, uh, Kevin Rudd and then Julia Gillard trying to price carbon, the mining tax. The problem is the way these reforms are attempted and executed now is not the way they were done in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Governments in the past spent a lot of time preparing the electorate with what the problem was, then identified their solution, campaigned on it, and then spent a while implementing it. At the moment, what we're seeing now is policies delivered on a take-it-or-leave-it basis, and then as soon as somebody puts their hand up and says, I don't like it, the government goes, all right, let's talk about something else. That's been the issue. It's the conduct of politics more than the difficulty of the reform that people are undertaking. George, just on the, the last part of uh, the question, um, we want to avoid a major economic recession. You've identified two key risk factors. One you've mentioned is the housing boom in Sydney and Melbourne. Some call it a bubble and the Chinese economy. Yeah, How big is the risk? Well, up until this point, we've been able to handle whether it's a global shock or a domestic crisis. If you've had the rest of the world in, in good shape, you, you we're able to deal with problems in the domestic economy. If the rest of the world is in bad shape but the domestic settings are fine, that takes you up to about 2008. But at the moment, we're pretty exposed. I don't think we've been in a situation quite like this outside of the really big bad episodes in our history where the rest of the world looks like it's about to come off again and domestically we're not match fit. We don't have a budget we can, that's in surplus that we could cut. We don't have interest rates that we cut in any meaningful way. You've got unemployment creeping up um, and elevated property prices in Melbourne and Sydney. Your history tells you when you get a domestic shock meeting a global shock that we can't handle the two together. And that's the thing that concerns me at the moment. But George, I think you're forgetting that uh, in the 1980s with those brilliant economic reforms of Hawke and Keating, John Howard was standing with Keating. There was consensus on them and they got them through the Senate. Similarly with the GST, uh, John Howard was able to negotiate with the Australian Democrats because Labor of course, oppose that reform. So, really, the history changed when governments were no longer able to build consensus with their opposition. And uh, I think we were very lucky that the 80s we had two outstanding treasurers and, and a prime minister who all understood the economic challenge facing us. Well, Prue, um, uh, uh, might, and I, might, I, just, might I just say it's not just consensus between the government and the opposition, it's also consensus between the states and the federal government. As we know, the New South Wales Premier, Mike Baird, hasn't shied away uh, from calling for big reforms. He called for the GST to be uh, put under serious consideration. Was he let down by the federal government? Uh, that was his view, that uh, we needed uh, extra money in taxation. Uh, the federal government's taken uh, a different view. Uh, I mean, Not your view? Well, the, the, I think 
not the Premier's view and not the New South Wales government's view, but I guess the issue is there are other ways perhaps of, of achieving the same thing. And yes, federation is always going to make reform difficult in Australia. Uh, you've got uh, state and federal governments that can often work completely opposite, uh, in an uh, opposing way to each other. But uh, oh, I must say, I think those golden years uh, of consensus and when they were both telling the same story, as you say, building that argument with the public, we have lost that. Laura Tingle. Look, I think um, all, all of those things are true and we've discussed them you know, at, at length in the past, but I sort of go back to the word reform. Uh, reform means changing the current system uh, or, you know, the status quo. And I suppose my feeling is that we've reached the absolute end of a, of a trajectory here uh, that's, that has been in, the, in place for 30 years. So that reform basically only means small government these days. Um, it doesn't mean anything else. Um, we're still having a discussion that I feel is very much uh, sort of, sort of based in the sort of economic conditions that were uh, in place in the 1980s, which was high inflation um, and, and, for that matter, a fixed exchange rate. Last week, we saw uh, the Consumer Price Index come out and we've got deflation in Australia now. Uh, the world is changing, Australia is changing, and I think the political debate is suffering as much from the fact that it hasn't actually been able to reposition itself and therefore bring people along. I mean, the idea of borrowing money to uh, build infrastructure to make the most of very low interest rates is just, you know, it's just blasphemy still. And both sides of politics are now talking about doing it, but trying to look like they're not doing it. Um, and I think this is part of the problem. I mean, it's not a question of the fact that we need budget restraint. Of course, we need to get the budget back into the black so that we've got some you know, cushioning room if there's a shock. All of those things are true. But I think we do have to find a new language to discuss this, to, uh, to galvanise people, because all of these phrases have just become so hollow. Ian, I'll come to you in a moment. Uh, James Fellows, I can see... Uh, just about to jump into the yes, conversation, so is. let me bring you in with an outsider's perspective. It is so fascinating to listen to this from, from an outside perspective because I do take seriously the fact there's been a decline from a golden era in, in uh, cooperation in Australia, and all of my Australian friends say they're distressed about the way deliberation happens in Australia now. But from the world perspective, Australia is still in a relatively fortunate position in all the trends you're talking about. One of them is polarization. In my own country, the United States, one party defines itself by the defeat of the other. When President Obama was elected, the uh, Mitch McConnell, the Senate, Senate Majority Leader, said, "Our goal is to, you know, keep make him a, a one-term president." You see, in Europe, you know, very bitter polarization. Um, the the question of being able to deal with the sorts of complex issues you've all been discussing about Australia's long-term future that is difficult in any country. The leading Republican candidate right now, Donald Trump, his answer on ISIS is, "You know, we're going to uh, defeat them, and that's it." You know, don't ask me for any details, I'll just, just get tough. And so, interestingly, in, in the U.S., the response to this kind of paralysis, which is much worse than what you are describing, has been actually a renaissance of local, city level and state level um, reform, innovation. So the only way, if this discussion were happening right now in D.C. or Los Angeles, San Francisco, the only positive side would be saying, yes, it's not working in D.C., but in Sacramento and in Albany and in all these other That's state capitals. But you're saying at the centre of government uh, in Washington, reform is yes. stifled by the political process. The, the, the paralysis of national level politics in the United States, which is in, a, in as bad a situation as it's been in 120 years, is leading perversely to a sort of renaissance of state and local innovation. But we're looking at a situation yeah. in the United States where this has been the story for 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Australia has only just been in this position. Oh. I think we identified the last 10 or 15. So we may be at the early part of the recognition of the problem. And, uh, there might be some madness to come. Let, let me bring uh, Ian in yeah. because, um, well, from your perspective, yeah. um, the citizens don't seem to be getting a say uh, in making these changes or in advising governments on these changes. You're right. We hear a lot about citizens having a say and, and governments saying we will consult the community. They tend to hear from a fairly noisy, self-selected part of the community. And we tend to differentiate and encourage governments to think there is community, there are community groups. They're two quite different audiences. Um, as James mentioned, polarisation. I heard uh, Greg's question originally about how do you get that reform, reform appetite. On any given reform question, you're going to see a bell curve distribution of views. Government today hears from one side that says you absolutely must do this, one side that says the world will end if you do what they want. 
and we're very, very much struggling to find those views across the middle. And that's what we see as the challenge. The problem is not a lack of leadership. The problem is actually not bad politicians. It's an invidious job made tougher by, by people like me sitting here and doing this. And it's from that point we say, well, actually, how do we empower leaders to lead? And that's how we look at the, the challenge. The challenge is not leadership. The challenge is the primacy of public opinion. We'll come back to, uh, in more detail, to some of those thoughts. Let's hear from our next questioner, Oliver Pocock, still on the same... Uh, yeah, still on the same question. Good evening. When Malcolm Turnbull challenged the former Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, for the leadership of the Liberal Party, he announced that Australia needed a government that respected the people's intelligence and explained complex ideas. However, since Malcolm Turnbull has taken over the leadership, we have seen a distinct void and lack of any communication with the people and um, the explaining of complex issues and seemingly no courses of action that can be logically followed. How can the voting public, particularly first-time voters such as myself, be assured that the government that is elected following the July election will actually keep their promises and provide the reform on both a social and eco uh, economic level? Let's start with the uh, only politician on the panel, yeah. Prue Goward. Oh. I think, actually, to, um, really, Malcolm Turnbull has been the great communicator. The one thing he has done a lot of is talking. Uh, he's explained his <laughs> ideas uh, a lot. Uh, his problem, if you like, is that, you know, they're less than a year, 18 months out from a federal election, and we all know that, as we've described, uh, a reform idea begins with a detailed discussion. You build consensus for the need for change. Then you explore your options uh, and then you present it to the people. You can't do that in 12 months. So I think Mr Turnbull's done what he needs to do at this point of the cycle, which is open the conversation, make it very clear that he thinks we need other options. Uh, and I think uh, as, the, as we get closer to an election, you're going to hear more about options. But I don't think you could ever say Malcolm wasn't... A talker. Do you think the, do you think the uh, critique that's um, implicit in that question is related to the fact that Malcolm Turnbull still doesn't have his own mandate and is looking for one as quickly as possible? And mandate is absolutely critical in modern Australia. Um, and uh, people, uh, both sides, take uh, liberties with what they mean by mandate. But uh, I think we will see a very different government after the election. But I think in the meantime, he's doing what you would be doing at this beginning, at the beginning of his leadership, which is explaining how he sees the economy working and how he sees our international relationships and uh, what, uh, where he thinks the weaknesses are. George. Well, your point was about the expectation Malcolm Turnbull raised in September last year when he, when he took the leadership. And in fact, I hadn't heard a leadership challenger articulate the problem of the entire era of politics as well as he did in seeking the job. So that Rudd Gillard Abbott era looked like it was going to end with him becoming Prime Minister. Now, I'm tempted to actually tack him on to the same era because the last six to nine months have been, in their own way, because the expectations were so high, quite disappointing. His very first idea was to reach back to a thing that we were talking about earlier, which was the GST, which is an idea of 15 or 20 years ago in the Australian setting, but it's an idea that began in Europe in the 60s, so it's not really a new policy. Realised that that thing didn't add up, which meant that the previous Prime Minister and Treasurer hadn't done the legwork for him to be able to pull the policy off the shelf if it was ready. And then he's been sort of searching for an agenda ever since. Uh, some big ideas, but... They get pulled in very came quickly, up with, they? came up with the innovation strategy, which is a, a new... Uh, well, I, I suppose, in a sense, because we're now having a debate about what that actually means. It's not entirely clear. Yeah. Uh, that oh, there is I, a I, new direction, surely. Yeah, but I've got, I've got the advantages. Uh, I'm not full-time on politics anymore and, and political journalism, so I'm sort of taking this thing in as you would think. Even I'm obviously a bit more informed than the average viewer, but I'm sort of taking it in as a punter would. And all I hear now is a guy trying to come up with a more sophisticated version of Tony Abbott's slogans. When I hear living within our means, I actually am not thinking of Tony Abbott anymore. I'm actually thinking of Malcolm Fraser in the 70s. Life wasn't meant to be easy, which is sort of this tough guy talk, which is not the expectation he raised in September of, of, of 2015. Now, it is certainly true it's not his government and he has to seek a mandate. But you don't seek a mandate just by sort of defaulting to politics at the last minute and try and uh, paint your opponent as an idiot, which is essentially what his campaign is well, against Bill Shorten. He's building his case. OK, yeah. let, me, let me shift it over to the other side of the table. And uh, uh, James, you uh, want to jump in again? Go ahead. As I do. And I, uh, yes, <laughs> no, but I'll, right. I'll stand back. Uh, two, two questions from a many-time voter to a first-time voter of all over. One thing I have learned is being a politician is hard. 
that you have to you know, expose yourself to sort of uh, rigors the rest of us don't. You have to be content knowing that millions of people dislike you. And it's, it's, I, I have great respect for people, politicians. The other thing is that political communication is hard. I once worked as a presidential speechwriter for Jimmy Carter long ago. And the trick is to get complex issues and try to explain them simply. It's more difficult than you would think. So I would say cut them a little bit of slack. Yeah. <laughs> Laura, go ahead. Well, I mean, this is the really fascinating thing to me about Malcolm Turnbull. Journalists and political journalists in particular are uh, you know, famously impatient and we're always supposed to be, you know, writing people off much too quickly. But I find myself in this position where I, I talk to people who aren't involved in politics and they're so angry about Malcolm Turnbull and I'm sort of f saying, well, wait a minute, he's only been there eight months mm. or however long. You know, seriously? I mean... Eight months ago, you were saying, or is it longer? It's all a bit of a nightmare now, but however long ago, everybody was saying, oh, Tony Abbott, he's just full of slogans and stupid ideas. Now we've got somebody who is trying to think about things. Mm. OK, he's... I think I sort of try to uh, class Malcolm Turnbull as too smart for his own good, in the sense that he does become interested in ideas. Loves ideas. Um, he's not great at the politics. And this is what makes this election campaign really fascinating to me. We've got this period where you've got this guy who's, you know, born to do the job in his, in his mind up against a, a street fighter. And this campaign will either see him turn into a prime minister who can lead, who can communicate, because it'll just snap into place, or he's going to spontaneously combust like the drummer from Spinal Tap. You know, we don't know which one it's going to be. It's, it's, that's what's interesting. He, what you're talking about, I think, is, it, uh, is a, a failure to really find that message that people can really uh, uh, sort of grab onto um, that, that in the same way they grabbed onto that message when he uh, mounted his challenge. And that's the really interesting bit about politics. You just can't pick how people are going to get uh, by when they become Prime Minister of Australia. We've uh, got a lot of questions, um, some from very young voters, which is great. Nadia Sujangi has a question. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. The challenge I believe we face in the 21st century is that our society tends to enjoy sensationalism and drama over facts. Democracy is about people collectively making decisions, but many Australians are not engaging with the facts to inform their decision-making about our government. Do you think that this inhibits politicians being able to make tough decisions and inhibits our country growing into a better nation? Let's start with Ian Walker. Fantastic question, Nadia. <laughs> it's, I don't know how we staged it, but thank you. <laughs> There's a wonderful thing called rational ignorance, and it's this. When you're one sixteen millionth of a vote, your incentive to read an IPCC report, a Ken Henry's tax review, your incentive is very small, and the rational choice is to go out do whatever you like to do on the weekend, do something with your family. The rational choice is not to read the information. And it never will be. In fact, when you go back to some of the prior questions as well, we have built a system that responds really well to slogans. We're going to see a lot of advertising we don't like, and we're going to see it, these political ads, because they work so well. We've built a system based on voting for the person you hate less. That's where we actually start to look at creating... <laughs> We actually need to start to look at creating something where we do create the incentives, and that's where we look at the structural change. And part of it is trusting sampling. You know, part of it's trusting different methodologies. We're going to trust a criminal jury to lock people up for 25 years. You know why we trust them? In my view, it's because it's a random mix from people from all walks of life. They look at all the information, just 12 of them, but there's no outside incentives. There's no, well, in, as in the American case, do you really want to elect judges? No, because we look at the election and says that impairs judgment. When we look at that, that small group of people look at a lot of information, find common ground and report that back to a judge. I think there's something to be learned that we've got structural impediments to people learning and reading. The only way we're going to get around it, 16 million people are never going to read everything, otherwise we might live in a slightly dull place. Ian, you might as well explain, um, now that you've got onto the idea of juries, that uh, your New Democracy Foundation does actually champion the idea of citizen juries dealing with policy issues. It's working already in some local government areas. The Victorian state government is also taking it on board. How does it work very briefly so that the others can consider this? Certainly. Uh, the brief idea is that we think there's a complementary role for randomly selected everyday people. This recognises that the elected tier have a fantastically hard job. It's absolutely hard to be subject to that kind of insight, well, insight, 
subject to that kind of focus and criticism so often. A randomly selected group of everyday people are given a challenge or a question, how can we pay for the health system we want? And from that point, if they can actually spend five months, six Saturdays, so 50 hours on an issue, this fits really well when someone's view will change on a topic between their two minute opinion poll view, or if I immerse you into that issue for 50, 60 hours across three months, you get access to sources of your choosing, will your view change? And the addition of information is often pretty rare and we see these transformative effects from local councils through state authorities such as infrastructure Victoria. Not to decide issues, but to advise on what people are thinking about them. Is that I how you... I think, almost going back to the first reform question, right now the, the room to move is a very, very small box. If you ask a group of citizens how they may solve that and they find common ground, they'll come back with a dozen ways they might be happy to see that solved. And that simply comes back to a parliament. And because it hasn't come from a t particular lobby group, it doesn't get the reflexive opposition. And simply put, it expands the array of choices a government of either persuasion can choose from. And it's about broadening that scope of action from what is a very small paddock at the moment. Laura, just, uh, just respond to that idea, if you wouldn't mind. What do you think? I mean, uh, would you worry? Obviously, you've written about the collective loss of memory in politics, which includes the, the loss of memory in the public service, which has been um, obviously damaged over a period of time in terms of relations with government. Do you think this sort of idea might help feed into political thinking? Um, look, I, I think it's definitely worth being open to these sorts of ideas. Um, another idea that you guys are pushing is the whole idea of about the, the, the what's the Senate, um, the, the, it's sort of like a people's Senate. And I was thinking about this uh, today. The idea is about trying to get rid of sort of the partisan nature of the upper house. And to me, the Senate uh, is the place where you see the worst of um, sort of really polarised politics, but you also see the sorts of opportunities that you're talking about, whether it's citizen juries or some other sort of sort of uh, semi-official Senate that reviews issues, because, um, you know, we all sort of uh, snigger about the cross benches when they come in, not just the current bunch, but previous bunches. But um, in my experience, you expose people who haven't had that experience and haven't had that exposure to ideas and policies and experts to this incredibly rich um, you know, a, a sort of absolutely sort of drowning uh, amount of information. And they all come out of it as very, th with very thoughtful approaches to things. You know, people like Ricky Muir, um, Jackie Lambie, you know, whatever their final positions are, they, they have just been completely transformed as parliamentarians, which is the other point. They're not just politicians, but they're parliamentarians. And they give very thoughtful approaches to um, legislating and uh, I think that's what what you're trying to achieve with the various sorts of um, uh, forums that let's, you're Let's go to the about. other side of the panel. Um, I, I, Prue, I, I can see you sort of squinting a little bit well, here. Your uh, Victorian uh, colleagues are <laughs> uh, doing less so because they're, uh, they've got a citizen's jury to look at infrastructure projects and look, to advise them. State governments do an enormous amount of uh, consultation with the community when, when we come to make big decisions. I did, uh, uh, when it came to uh, domestic violence refor reform, uh, when, we, when it came to medical cannabis, uh, when it came to adoption. They were all very long consultative processes that we ran. And then there's the other side of the equation, Prue, which is focus groups, which uh, some politicians use to work out which side of bed to get out of well, in the morning. But, well, to tell me who they were, because um, I, I'm not familiar with them. I mean, in a bit. way, a parliament is a collection of well-meaning amateurs. It is, there are no qualifications to be in parliament. You don't have to have a degree or a certificate. You are there because you represent your community. You have made your case to your community and you are seen as the best person to represent that community. Now, that's what you're talking about, except that there aren't... There's only a hundred and something or other of them in the federal parliament and 90 uh, odd of them in New South Wales. I'm just going to uh, prove, because you've raised that issue, I'm going to go straight to another question of Courtney Ellis, who's got a question along these lines. Thank you, Courtney. Good evening. Um, my question is, how can our political system successfully meet the challenges of the 21st century when it is inhibited by practices such as factionalism and nepotism. As a young person watching the media and following recent pre-selections, most of the candidates are ex-members of politicians. How can we engage a wider range of Australians from diverse backgrounds into our political system to achieve our potential as a country? 
I think you were saying ex-staffers of policy, yeah, so political staffers, yeah. yeah. Uh, George, what do you think? And uh, just you can canvas that question, yeah. but also the previous... Yeah, I, will, I will canvas the previous one as well. One of the interesting things that's happening now is that the people of Australia, under a compulsory voting system, have introduced a volatility in the election, election system that occurs in the US in a voluntary system. So the people themselves are trying to smash the two-party system. The reason why we've had as many Prime Ministers as, as Greece in the last five years, the reason why we have the possibility of, a, of even a one-term coalition government, and we've had one-term governments at the state level and obviously at the federal level, um, well, a near miss for the Labor Party in 2010, is that the main parties can't uh, collect the sorts of votes they did in the past where you had 40% of the population would turn up and vote Labor all their lives, 40% would vote coalition, and the action was really with the last 20. At the moment, the single biggest block in, in the Australian political system at the moment is the unaligned voter. And that is something that the electorate is not doing consciously, but they are behaving rationally. Now, a lot of this volatility, um, we talk about difficulty getting reforms going, I think the electorate is sending a very, very important signal to the parliament, which is if you keep presenting us with the same hack, which is almost indistinguishable from left or from right, we're going to continue to flip our governments until we get a better conversation. So in that sense, when you ask what are the people doing about it or what can we do about it to become more engaged, People are doing it at the ballot box anyway. Mm. Now, the question is, how do you navigate this volatility? So, uh, if you were Malcolm Turnbull, you'd have to build a coalition. You wouldn't be narrow casting with a 70s agenda on class warfare. If you were Bill Shorten, you'd want to be building a coalition. You wouldn't be arguing to your left flank with the Greens and then just talking about increased spending here or there or a bit of class warfare with some upper, upper uh, income uh, tax hikes. So, I think the people want the language of politics to change. My question has always been, when's the recognition point in the system? When the system does seek a new stability? Because at the moment, the revolving door is, is a function of the electorate saying, hang on a minute. Just, just pick up on that idea of factionalism, George, and uh, I, I suppose it raises the question as to whether Malcolm Turnbull himself cannot be Malcolm Turnbull that, that appeared before he became leader, because, partly at least, because of factionalism. Here's unpopular. a radical thought. If Malcolm Turnbull ran against his party today, his vote would go up. And it would happen. So, so instead of, I mean, he knows this, but at the moment, you know, this is quite an unusual bargain. You're coming into, you're coming into power in the, in the final year of a first-term a first government. It's very difficult to navigate all the conflicting egos and agendas. Um, I just remember famously a few years ago, Peter Beattie uh, had a corruption inquiry spring up, and he was still a minority government at the time. And he ran against his own party and, and won in a landslide. And remember John Howard saying the very next day after that election, he says, I've never seen a leader run against a party before and saw what happened, saw what happened to his vote. This thing has been out there for a long, long time, so... And I think we all forget, with respect, factions are rather overstated. In the end, parties want to win. In the end, parties want to put up people who they believe represents uh, the community's mm. interests and, and will succeed as advocates for the community. OK, so, I'm going to go to think, another, uh, another question on this topic. It's from Luke Broadhurst, and uh, we'll hear from the other panellists. Takes us in a slightly different direction. Thank you. Australians suffer from the lowest political party membership in the advanced world. Does this mean that political parties aren't in touch with the Australian population? In the US, it's seen the rise of anti-establishment candidates. Are we likely to have an Australian Donald Trump? <laughs> I'm going to go to uh, James Fellows uh, not uh, to answer the yes. final part of the question. Yes. I, I guess you wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. But no, I, I wouldn't. The idea, <laughs> listening to this, the yes. idea that, that an anti-establishment candidate has been thrown up now by a major party the, in the, the United States. Uh, so let me say a word about Trump in the United States, which is all I, I, I care to say, and then, then about a theme that goes through all of these very interesting recent questions by, by Oliver, and Nadia and Courtney and, and now Luke. What to say about Donald Trump? Well, here's what, what the rise of Trump indicates. He, if he is surprising to all of you, there's a reason for that. There has never been anyone like him in American politics before. There's never been anybody nearing a major party nomination, which he's likely to get. He's likely to be the Republican nominee with no prior experience in public life. He's never been a head of military office, never been a judge, anything like that. So it's unusual in that way. You're also seeing a political party sort of break itself apart, and you wonder, how can this happen? And the reason it's happened in the United States is a combination, a conflation, a merger of the skills of politics with the skills of pure entertainment. Now, here's the reason I mention this. I think for all the young voters who are just asking these questions, um, 
in, during your conscious lifetimes, the idea has been there's not been that much separation between what democracy means and what people just want in any given moment. But the people who thought about the mechanics of democracy, all of the founding fathers in my country and the Westminster people who've affected the rest of the world, they recognized that you needed to think hard about how democracy worked. That if people just had their, their raw mm. passions, uh, if you ask children whether to decide whether or not to go to school, they wouldn't go to school. If you ask them what they wanted to eat, they might not eat what, what, uh, what you thought they, they should. And so too in, in governance. If you ask people just what is interesting, they will give you Donald Trump because he is by far the most interesting figure on the American scene and God save us that prevails six, six months from now. So on the question of whether, um, whether Australians can, be, uh, can revive themselves and all the rest, I think it involves conscious thought like unto what people were doing centuries ago on how to make a democracy work. And we've heard many ideas on that. But so if those of you who are young voters think hard about what it takes to make this democracy function, it can work. Now, is, is Donald Trump, um, is, is his popularity or this emergence of this incredible showbiz figure, is it about um, a group of non-mainstream um, voters wanting to smash the system as they see it? Or is it something else? Is it pure entertainment? I, I think that has been overstated, the sort of rage and fury that, that Americans allegedly feel. I think that, and here's the way you can test that. Bernie Sanders also has an outsider campaign, so does Ted Cruz. The demeanor of people at their rallies is different. You don't hear Ted Cruz saying, beat people up if they disagree with you. You don't hear Sanders saying, let's get rid of the Muslims. So I think this is largely Donald Trump's whipping up fury rather than writing discontent. I think that both are, are, are factors, but the fact that he is such a, a uh, reality show performer is the main variable. Is it and and uh, uh, so just want to, because yeah. I'm fascinated yeah. just to hear your thoughts on very briefly, um, would he be a demagogue if he became president? He probably would be less destructive as president than he has been as a candidate, just because he, he couldn't be as, as yeah. crazy and just, and, and, and I bet if you asked him what country Tasmania was part of, he wouldn't know. I mean, he just, he just doesn't know anything about how, how the world is, but he has already been profoundly damaging to my country. He has legitimized a kind of hatred that was not, uh, mm -hmm. not legitimate before. All right, let's go uh, to the rest of the panel. We can come back to the Australian issues as well, uh, Ian. Look, the Trump jumping off point is an obvious one, and it's every presidential election. People say it's crazier than ever, it can't get worse. And I think people in some ways see Trump as an end point. And I'd encourage them to reflect that Kanye West has declared his intent for presidential <laughs> run in 2020. So it can get crazier yeah. and it points to the systemic issue. It actually goes to Courtney's question earlier, one I hope everyone running for office watches again because if my eyesight's any good, you're in a school uniform, so you're not yet voting. And you've picked that we have an insider's problem. And it actually came to each of the points we've heard here. We have a system that is skewed that benefits those inside. We did a little bit of Excel analysis on the 220-odd uh, people in our federal parliament. 226, I should say. It's based on the last parliament. Have they had more than five years' experience in a non-paid political job? Have they been student politicians? Have they worked as a political advisor? Knock those three criteria out. Do you want to know what that number is? It's only a tick over 20. It's actually a very small number. And it makes sense. These are not bad people. But if you've got an intent, as you might, to run for office, your smart play is to work inside a minister's office. It's to understand the network and the contacts. We have built a system, all systems will tend towards a little professionalism. So we're not saying get it out, throw out. I do have a slightly radical backer, Luca would throw everyone out. But on a, on a more nuanced side, we could potentially go down a path of saying, what are the counterbalances we could put on? So that those with incentives, we also hear a separate voice from those who aren't subject to the electioneering imperative. And that's that balancing point I think we need to look for. Yeah, Laura, I'll bring you in. Um, <laughs> the first part of that question was Australia. Thank you very much. Uh, Australia uh, suffers from the lowest levels of political party membership in the advanced world. What's the reason for that? Um, well, I think uh, you know, there, there are sort of several reasons for it. One of them is that if you look at the history of the parties, you know, particularly Labor, it was obviously um, a, a product of a particular historical time that's moved on. Um, our our class structure has changed in, uh, during my lifetime. Um, our institutional structures have changed. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons. And in general, we aren't joiners as we once were. We don't go to church. Uh, we don't belong to political parties. 
Uh, we don't, we're not joiners. Um, but I suppose I also feel that, you know, somebody should say, and I suppose it should be a journalist who says it, it's not all the politicians' fault. Um, I mean, you look at what's happening in the structure of the media, uh, and this is a point I talk about in my latest quarterly essay, which isn't supposed to be a plug, but never. Um, but it's, <laughs> it, it's about, if I look at what's happened in my own newspaper or the other newspapers, we don't have specialist reporters anymore because the media is in a state of flux. So what do we do? We approach stories as generalists. You know, if you have a, if you have a story about submarines, you, you approach it from the position that you're comfortable with. And so often these days, uh, that is from the position of the political drama of the moment, the soap opera. And so, you know, we're sort of saying, is this good for the government's political fortunes or bad for the political fortunes? Does it actually uh, sort of, you know, what, what does the French bid look like against the German one? I don't know. <laughs> All boats, you know. But, you know, it, it, so it's not just about the political parties, I don't think, or the yeah, politicians. No, we, but it's this drama. I'm just going to quickly go back to uh, questioner Luke Broadhurst. Luke, uh, come on in. I wonder if the political parties are actually interested in increasing their membership. Are they doing anything to diversify themselves from within? Well, well there's, the, there's, the, there's their membership and then there's who they uh, represent, who, who represents them in Parliament, which have become in some ways completely separated, um, you know, separate, separate uh, sort of mechanisms and organisms, I think. Uh, nobody feels that they have, have to have this really strong grassroots support. I mean, Labor's made a few attempts at it, uh, but the really big change that, uh, you know, the reformers in Labor tried to get through a couple of years ago and have tried a couple of times to get through was to deal with um, who got pre-selected in upper houses in the Senate or in uh, the legislative councils, and the faction stopped them doing that. But that is where you get the sort of uh, the really close selection of, of the old school, of the sorts of people uh, that Ian's been talking about. But you know there, there isn't all that much attention, as far as I can see, or all that much angst in the last few years on really broadening out membership other than talk about, you know, online I'll just members. quickly go to Prue here because, uh, well, A, because you <laughs> want to get in and, uh, B, because I'm interested in no, your politician's well, perspective. That's right. And I can tell you, uh, politicians are very keen on having people join their party. Uh, and what you find when you invite people to join your local branch is that they say, I'll turn up for you on election day, uh, never voted anything but Liberal, always talk about how good you are, don't feel the need to join a political party. Uh, and I think that's a sign of a fairly comfortable country. I suspect people join political parties when they think something is fiercely wrong and they want it changed. Uh, and in a way, I think the fact that our political parties are small uh, is, is comforting for all of us. Um, well, we, before we get too relaxed and comfortable, let's go to our uh, next question. Now, remember, by the way, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, send a tweet using the hashtags factcheck and quanda. Keep an eye on our Twitter account for the verdicts from ABC Fact Check Unit and the Conversations Academics. And our next question is a video. It's from uh, Rhys Bosley in Brisbane. Hi, my question to the panel is, do you think that the theme of this week's show which is whether or not the Australian political system is up to the challenges of the 21st century might miss the point. Could it be that we, the Australian public, are all too selfish and spoiled to allow real reform to happen? Yeah, George, we'll start with you there. Uh, I know it's an easy thing to say, and I think we've all written a column to this extent at one point or another that the public are confounding, but I don't think we're selfish. I think that one thing that hasn't changed in the culture... And Luke, I will come back to your question. The interesting thing about Australians is that they almost since 1788, since uh, Philip landed with uh, a 1,000 convicts, um, have a big trust in government, which is a bit atypical globally, mm. but we've always hated the governor, so we've always hated the person at the top. Um, so <coughs> I don't think the Australian people are, are, are that selfish that they're not willing to be governed. I think they want to be governed. One of the reasons why people are, are so stressed out at the moment is that they've got a succession of of what appears to be very temporary fixes by the political parties to what is their structural problem, which is that they're not connected to the, to the population at large. But the other thing is the population is changing a lot quicker, I think, than, than the parties are in a position to cope with. So I'll answer the question about the selfishness first and then we'll, I'll talk about what Australia looks like. Australia doesn't look anything like the parliament today. But the question of selfishness is the Labor Party have actually got a good discussion going about raising taxes. 
there was projection under Malcolm Turnbull if you could get a GST going, we'd be, we'd be for that as well. So the idea of increasing taxes, I don't know that there's a Western jurisdiction in the world where you could still have that conversation. So as I say, I think we're willing to be led. Now, the issue of what Australia looks like. Australia looks nothing like the parliament. In fact, it looks nothing like a press gallery. 28% um, of the population is born overseas. Another 20% have at least, is local born of at least one parent who's immigrant. In Sydney and in Melbourne, those two figures add up to close to two thirds. The last time the country looked like this was the 1870s, except it was very Anglo then with a bit of Chinese and a bit of German. Now it is Eurasian. And until that part of the 21st century economy, uh, conversation is had, we're not able to answer a lot of these other questions. Because mm. the way our population has been moving in the last 15 years especially is creating pressures in our everyday lives in terms of congestion in your cities, in terms of basically the way your country functions. There's a lot of upside, but basically in the way your country functions. Your politics, your 20th century politics is not equipped to deal with these challenges. And some of these challenges, I would say, are actually functions of success, not functions of failure. Um, I think... Um, given, the, given the change in uh, the nature of the country, its demographics, what do you think changes in the, what people want? Don't they all want the same things? Um, a good education system, a good health system and all of the things that they expect government to deliver, good transport and so on? I think... What changes? I don't think that's actually changed. I think government's actually gone off basic service delivery. I think they've spent the last 30 years convincing themselves that government has no role in the marketplace, i.e. has no role in society. They provide safety nets, which is a handout transaction, but don't do much capacity building. Oh, I don't think that's true of it's state government. That's, 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 that's what we do. No, no, that's, that, no, no, it's essentially the way... I mean, you know, Hang on, let, 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 me, uh, for years let, let, let me just take think. control for a minute and yeah, uh, yeah. James wants to uh, make a point. The, and we'll there is the other an side. interesting parallel in the Australian and US experience here. I think the proportion of foreign-born people in the Australian population now is about twice what it is in the US, yes. 28 to approximately 14. And for the US, this is a relative high. It was last time it was this high was about 100 years ago. And even with a level that's about um, half that of Australian, there is tremendous effort within the US at Americanization, mm -hmm. of having people sort of understand what the rules are and the values are. And I'm curious whether Australia has the same emphasis on Australianization, if that is one factor too, and in, in the, with this change in political culture you're, you're talking about. Laura. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, I don't think there is as much focus on Australianisation because we've got the sort of sort of other strand yeah. of multiculturalism. But I mean, I think the other half of the, the of this equation, which is very interesting, is about population itself, yeah. which is a conversation we don't have. I think it was uh, John Edwards, the economist, who pointed out a few years ago that you know the the population of Australia had grown yeah. by you know three or four million people over a decade and we hadn't noticed. Mm. Now, now this, apart from the cultural effect of this and the political effect, it obviously also has this massive economic effect. You know, suddenly we have to build a lot more houses and as George has written in his latest quarterly essay, you know, the last few state elections in Victoria have basically been fought on public transport because people can't get on the train in the morning because the infrastructure mm. hasn't right. kept up. But we don't frame our conversations. There are promises that the budget might yeah. start to uh, look at some of those things tomorrow. We'll have to wait and see, obviously. And, and just one crucial clarification. Yeah. Americanization and Australianization coexist with multiculturalism, mm. teaching about the rules for, yeah. a, for a diverse culture. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Except just... that you've got a presidential candidate who wants to build a big wall between... Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, 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 leave yes. that aside, Ian. <laughs> yeah. To go to the original question, yeah. I don't think citizens are selfish. <laughs> I think we've built a fairly simplistic system and it's, if you look at voting ads on television, they're a lot like how you would buy Coca-Cola or Doritos. It's low involvement, quick response, and that's what we get. We have a little bit of choice and we respond to that choice. And there's a temptation always to come back to why has the tone and tenor of debate been lowered? Because there's a bunch of analysts that sit there and look at the results and say, this works really well. If you wanted to win and retain office, it's not about the people, you could have Mother Teresa running for Prime Minister, she would run the same horrendous attack ads we're about to see because they work really well. You've got to stop getting past, stop blaming the people in those offices and start thinking we need to just trial some new things. All right. and, I, and I think well, people no, no, sorry. are... No, I think it's important one, to say, please. yes, that um, people aren't selfish, but they are nervous about change because they've been disappointed. And that's why, in the end, all these questions about how, how much uh, the, the public should understand about public policy, what they've done is they've decided they will vote for a government they trust. So that we were the basket case economy when we came to government. Four years later, we were, according to ComSec,
the number one economy. And then when Mike Baird took poles and wires to the electorate, they trusted him because they were satisfied with what they'd seen over the last four years. Also because he promised to give something at the other end, which is to deal with some of these big infrastructure issues, y transport and yes, so on. Yes, and because he had always... We'd always delivered, mm. they believed that they, we would continue to deliver. So it, trust is a default for a people that don't want to be day-to-day uh, -day, uh, involved in the complexities of public policy. And it's a very good system and it's done us very well for 200 years. OK, our next question is from uh, Lauren Milanos. Rejecting New Zealand's offer to take 150 refugees is a poor attempt at lessening the success of people smugglers. People do not seek asylum because a people smuggler convinced them through effective marketing. The only way to lower the amount of ref refugees produced globally, globally is to end the conflict in their country of origin. When can we stop purposefully denying existing refugees their futures simply to use them as a deterrent and help them as is every developed country's duty? George, uh, I'll bring you in on that first. You raise the idea of... Population asylum seeker issues, refugees, all yeah, the refugee issue is seen the last couple of weeks, and especially late last week with the High Court decision in Papua New Guinea. Manus Island is clearly not functional at the moment, but the government thinks, well, if we bring them on shore, then we've lost the debate, then we're going to lose an election. At the moment, both Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten would rather talk about something else. They certainly don't want to see boats coming in the middle of an election campaign. My difficulty with especially the policy, the way it's been conducted, especially the last few years since Kevin Rudd escalated the competition of cruelty with this policy to transport uh, asylum seekers before they'd even be assessed the refugees to a third country with uh, you're not going anywhere if you, if you don't go home um, uh, um, order. The difficulty we have now, because we've had, uh, we had a poor fellow set himself alight the other week who's just passed away, and another person I just noticed has just set himself alight. It doesn't matter how many boats come or don't come, if, if, if one person a week is setting themselves alight in the context of an election campaign, sooner or later it's going to start to tug at our consciousness that we're holding hostage hundreds of people simply because we can't sort this issue out. And like, I've always had difficulty with this topic. I know I've got friends on both sides in Canberra who think I don't understand the complexity of it. Probably I don't understand the complexity of it. I actually think in the long run, uh, the world, when it pays attention to Australia, wants to see a good citizen. Mm. Because we are quite well off. We've been able to manage prosperity probably better than any other society over the long haul. And when we start playing these other games, this trying to be the nastiest country in the region, try to be the nastiest, you know, you know, our trumping Trump before Trump had even been invented in terms of asylum seeker policy, I think sooner or later our luck runs out as a society. I think there's an issue of karma here that we shouldn't be messing with. I'm just going to uh, bring in James because, uh, again, an outsider's perspective, but you've arrived on a day where yeah. there's news of, of, a, of an Iranian refugee who burned himself alive, yes. who did not get medical attention for such a long time that it appears to have degenerated his condition. Yeah. When he finally reaches the Australian mainland, he dies. Um, I mean, you're old enough to have uh, remember the Buddhist monks burning yes. themselves in Vietnam. Yes. So I'm going to agree with the premise of, of Lauren's question that Australia does not look good at the moment with this policy, either side of the debate, but no one looks good right now. Uh, Angela Merkel is having terrible trouble in Germany because of a relatively liberal policy. The rest of Europe is splitting itself apart. We have Trump in the, in the United States, and I, I think that we this is is an example of a problem of human inequality, of combat, of cruelty around the world that, that will make um, all of our countries look and be bad until, as, as, as Lauren says, the actual sources that are making people uh, just flee around the world are, are addressed. I think that Australia should do, well, the U.S. proportionately takes, I think, about as many refugees as Australia does. We take about 70 or 80,000 a year in the United States. I believe that is about proportional to what Australia does. But I think that rich, democratic countries like ours, recognizing all the complexities of not wanting to, to encourage people smuggling and, and all the rest, do have a moral duty. To, to be uh, to to take in people and, and to, sh to address the roots of the cause uh, of the problem, but also to take people people in as George was Let's uh, go to yeah. Laura Tingle. This moral duty uh, yeah. that James uh, Fellows yeah. talks about here, have we lived up to that uh, when it comes to 
uh, these people who, as the questioner says, are being held effectively as deterrents to stop others no. coming? Uh, well, no, we haven't. Um, I suppose there are two issues here. One is the broader one, uh, which we've had bouts of addressing, uh, which is that um, both sides of politics, when they've been really pushed, uh, for example, when, that, uh, when those really awful images of the little boy um, yeah. in, in, the, uh, in the Mediterranean um, aired, suddenly we developed a bit of a conscience and it said we'd take more refugees. So there's one issue which is, should we be taking more refugees? And I think the answer probably is yes, and that's going to... Uh, you, you just sense that that is going to have to be one of the outcomes. Um, and the second issue is, you know, Manus Island and Nauru were supposed to be temporary. Um, now, I don't think either side of politics um, has covered it themselves in uh, glory on this, but... It's been was... reported, in fact, that the uh, gentleman who set himself alight um, was among a group who were told that they would be there for 10 years or more. Yeah, and it's a particularly problematic thing for Iranian uh, uh, refugees or asylum seekers uh, because if uh, they've found... With the... If the assessment goes against them and they don't want to go home, they're basically in, in a, a complete no man's land. But um, it was supposed to be a temporary thing. And I think the really disturbing thing about the uh, implications of the Papua New Guinea uh, de decision, uh, apart from the fact that they've ended up looking much better than we do um, on these issues, is that it makes it almost impossible, I think, for Australia to now find someone else to help us if we're going to continue with this particular policy. And it's interesting that you hear very little mention of Cambodia uh, in the last week, which is supposed to be where everybody was so excited to be going. Uh, Prue, um, one of the, the first part of the question actually raised the idea that uh, New Zealand, which had offered to take a percentage of these people, that offer had been rejected. Um, wouldn't there be some way around that to allow them to go to New Zealand but with something in their passports that said they couldn't come to Australia? Well, that's really... I mean, it's not an issue I have to say I follow very closely and it's something that uh, obviously the Australian government's decided it doesn't want to deal with. Just after your opinion, really? No, and I'm giving it to you. you do you have an opinion? I don't have an opinion. OK. Because my opinions have to be fa based what, on facts. If I could just say... Just Coming back full circle to the question, one thing John Howard did after he set up the Pacific Solution, he, no other country wanted to take... They, New Zealand took 100 or so off the Tampa, but no other country wanted to bail us out. And eventually, when the issue died down, remember what he did? He quietly brought them on shore. And some of them making, obviously making terrific Australian citizens today. And, in fact, they wouldn't realise that they'd been pawns in this political thing in 2001, 2002, 2003. He's quite grateful to be here, quite loyal. I'd... Be fascinated to know how John Howard feels about the inability of either Rudd, Gillard, Abbott and now Turnbull to be able to engineer the humanitarian fix below the line, i.e. to keep the thing going. Mm. Now, I, can't, I, I don't know... I don't know, I don't know do, do you see any sign that either side has given hard thought into how to deal with this problem in the long term? I'm quite, I'm quite confident that they've been thinking about it because the advice they get is whatever you do, you can't send the signal because basically there's been an escalation since 2001. So if you send the signal that the doors are open again, you will have another 50,000 people coming in a year. And that is a, that is a very difficult issue. Except that they came up with the idea of turning back the boats, which appeared to be the key thing that stopped people coming. Yeah, but once, once, once you've established that... Taking it back to John Howard's mindset, John Howard's mindset was, well, how many people have we got there? A few hundred? Well, say 850 or at the moment in limbo. At some point, he would say, we can't live in there forever because attrition will start to take over and we're going to look pretty mean. Um, especially when the majority of them, as we know, are assessed as genuine refugees. Uh, uh, assessed as refugees. I should never use the qualifier of genuine. A refugee is a genuine person fearing persecution. So look, bear in mind who we're talking about. A book worth consulting is a book called The Camp of the Saints, maybe 40 or 45 years old, by a French author named Jean Raspail, R-I-S-P-A-I-L. It's a, a uh, sort of a dystopian novel of exactly this dilemma confronting countries like ours. Ian, what do you think? One of those classic issues where all courses of action open to a government will be criticised. Now we've seen through a number of years, uh, through Kevin Rudd taking an effectively uh, opposite position to that which we see today, and it was a continual uh, item of criticism. Some things are just hard. We look at crime, tax, planning, areas of low public trust. It starts to fall into the same area. I think where you can start to expand a conversation and give governments a, a greater sense of 
we've considered this and there's alternate options, but some things are just hard. And as, as something to have looked at across the spectrum, all courses of action will get you criticised. We see it in a range of issues, and this is another low trust Quickly area. Quickly going to go, there's a gentleman there with his hand up uh, on that side, his hand up for a while. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, um, the root cause of the uh, refugee issue hasn't been discussed or put up in the media. It's been reported in the ne Indonesian media that the Indonesian military actually put the people on the boats and sent them to Australia. The criminals are the Indonesian military who commit mass murder and torture of the West Papuan people. Why isn't the Australian government doing something about that? Now, we're told that, uh, you know, we put uh, asylum people in on women refugee camps, why isn't the Australian government tackling the Indonesian military, the military who commit mass murder and torture of the West Papuan people? OK. George. We're not taking that as a comment, are we? Uh, uh, <laughs> I, 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 was, I was tempted to, but I think it's best that someone answer. It, it, it is... It is, it is uh, I can't speak to the specifics of what you've read, because I haven't read it. Um, but it is true that the two inflections in this debate, 2001 and around the, with the Tampa and the Oceanic Viking in uh, 2009, was related to a breakdown in the relationship between the Prime Minister's office and the Indonesian government. So John Howard had a, had a problem with Megawati. Uh, it's a kind of poetry, but was, um, there was, she was accusing him of megaphone diplomacy at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and SBY, even though he was favourably disposed to Australia, Kevin Rudd did put him in a very difficult position when he was basically making policy on the run with the dealing of the, um, of the uh, Oceanic Viking incident. But I think <laughs> Indonesians still have our best interests at heart here, and... Uh, the fact that they aren't doing, say, what the Cubans did to the Americans in the 1980s, which was open their prisons and send them all to Florida, I think we've actually got, more often than not, a much better relationship with the Indonesians than you might, you might uh, want to give them credit. But it is true that those two, big ish, those two big spikes in arrivals did have something to do with a breakdown between Canberra and Jakarta. Yeah, I'm just going to go back to you um, on the previous uh, question, really, and that is whether a jury system, uh, whether a jury of Australians... Uh, would come up with uh, potential solutions to something like this or whether they might reflect a general prejudice? Very rarely, I'm going to say never, do we see a general prejudice. I get the question from elected representatives all the time. If I let citizens go at this issue, pick your area. They won't like old people. They'll cancel Meals on Wheels. And it just never happens. We exist as a research foundation for this reason to test it out and we've never seen a group of people come back and act frankly, out of pure self-interest and beggar thy neighbour somewhere else. It's an awful thing to sit here and say, yes, we could do it better. It is an invidious task facing whichever person in government lands with this. Can a complementary role be played? Perhaps. But the last thing I want to do is sit here and say, you know, there's a, there's a silver bullet to be fired. There's not. But there is an expansion in the way we make public decisions, because what is coming out very clearly is there is no trust. All right, let's go to... We've got time for one last question. This one comes from Andrew Palmer. Hi. Um, a few years ago, John Oliver did a segment on the gun control legislation that was introduced in the wake of the Port Arthur massacre. And as part of that, he asked uh, an American politician and an Australian politician the question, what makes a politician successful? The American politician reply, replied, getting re-elected, while the Australian politician re replied, making society a better place. Has politics in Australia reached the point now where politicians are unwilling to take a stand on important but divisive issues for fear of damaging their chances of re-election? Yeah, I'll bring Prue in first on this one. Mm. Well, very happy, <laughs> very happy to answer that, and I think Australian politicians absolutely are prepared to do that. I mean, I always think the courageous person in uh, the Port Arthur massacre, which you've referred to, was actually Tim Fisher, because it was the Nationals mm who stood to lose so much uh, from the ban on guns. Um, but I, I think uh, the Australian public make it very clear when there is a do-or-die issue, and they did in the case of that massacre. Uh, and I have no doubt that Australian politicians of both sides will continue to respond. Um, James, I'll bring you in. I, I'm not 100% sure whether uh, it's a general position that all Australian politicians just want to make the world a better place <laughs> as opposed to win elections, but nonetheless, yeah. I'll bring you in on this because it's yes, I, I think a big the, issue for you in the United States. The contrast that John Oliver drew was not really fair. You could find politicians say that say the opposite things in either case, but the Port Arthur uh, massacre is, is invoked repeatedly by President Obama mm. 
Every time there's a shooting in the United States, he says, look, it is possible for democracies to cope with this evil. There is no other society than the United States that has repeated gun massacres. Norway has one, they do something. Australia has one, they do something. Scotland has one, and they do something. Only in the United States does it go on and on and on. So the example of the vision that Australian politicians and Australian people showed in dealing with this, this evil is often cited in the United States. I am optimistic about most things in my country. I am not optimistic about our, referring to America's collective ability to deal with this. The obstacles are too great. Perhaps, Ian, we can bring you in and you can find <laughs> solutions. Well, for I us. mean, uh, <laughs> James, would, first of all, you'd actually yeah. have to change the Supreme Court um, yes. and get them to understand or to redefine what a well uh, regulated militia is. Exactly. And that's in the process, you know, the Grim Reaper, that will happen uh, eventually with the Supreme Court's change. But, but in practical terms, there are something, there are some hundreds of millions of guns that already are at large in the United States population. So if you sold no new ones starting tomorrow, you would have a sort of lifetime, so to speak, supply of these guns there. So it is a, right. it is the most difficult issue for right. the United We're States. running out of time, but I'd like to hear from the other panelists. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Ian. Uh, Andrew, your question goes to, I think, uh, one of those general curiosities of, well, if so many people want something to change, you know, there's many issues where there's perhaps 80% public support. We hear it about uh, euthanasia laws, we hear it about marriage equality. 80%, a large number of the electorate wants something to change, why doesn't it move? Electoral systems don't run on 80%. They run on the 1.5% who will get so profoundly irritated by something that they'll change their primary vote. Liquor regulation, alcohol regulation, Australians don't like to be told mm. when they can have a drink. Mm. You may see general 60, 70% support. It's not about the 70%, it's that 1.5% who will move. Marriage equality laws will extremely motivate people at different ends of the spectrum. So that middle bulge of support doesn't matter so much. So, yeah, I think, the, um, I think a little bit of each in terms of getting elected and doing good things but the incentives are very acute and moving 1% moves electoral systems. You know, actually, it brings us almost back to the beginning, Laura, and I suppose if 80% of the population want certain things to happen and they never do, uh, people start to get a bit irritated with politicians. Uh, people do start to get irritated with politicians, but I think the interesting thing is that a certain, you know, we're talking about self-interest self of politicians, if you like, of wanting to get re-elected versus what, what the community wants. And I think... The interesting thing, once again, about this campaign is that we've now got the Labor Party in this position where it's got absolutely nothing to lose. I mean, you know, it's, it's a one... We've had a one-term government. Nobody thinks that Labor... No, nobody thought that Labor could win. So they're going out there and they are taking political risks. And I think that's sort of one of those interesting cycles in politics that, you know, there, there are... There is the hope that we always have that politicians will you know, just do the right thing and try to be noble about stuff. Um, and in, in the current generation, Malcolm Turnbull's probably one of the classic examples of somebody who got burnt when he was trying to be supportive of uh, Labor on emissions trading. But we've now got this sort of full circle thing where we've got a bunch of politicians who say, we've got nothing to lose and we've just seen two, two or three governments come in without a mandate to do anything and we might as well just go for it because we might just win, and if we do, we've got a mandate to do quite radical things compared to the current status quo. George, I'll give you the final word. I think one thing we've observed the last few years is actually the volatility in the political system. So the risk-averse, negative politician has actually been punished by the electorate. And as I say, that's even though it's made governing more difficult, it's actually a very rational thing to do, and you'd actually applaud it. So. The question then becomes, can either side of politics or a combination of the two uh, do the reset? Now, we have had an experience, we had an experience after the Second World War and we certainly had an experience after the calamity of the 70s, where both sides of politics were able to govern for a long time. So the Curtin, Chifley, Menzies governments collectively governed for just under 25 years and so did Hawke, Keating and Howard. We're in a situation today which looks a lot like the first 20 or 30 years of Federation. So I hope it's temporary because I'd hate to, I'd hate to be reporting another 10 years of this, but I think the electorate has already, has already administered the shock that ultimately your survival instinct in government is come up with ideas. So and, that's that's and, what I hope that's yeah. what I hope we're seeing at the and moment. And you realise that no government is going to support ideas that don't get it re-elected and what gets it re-elected is reflecting what the public 
wants and expects. So, in fact, this lie about politicians doing things for their own sakes and not for the sake of the national or the state interest is rubbish. You can't get elected if you don't represent the national or the state interest. Well, that's where we'll have to uh, leave it for tonight. Um, thank you very much. And thank to, thanks to our panel, Ian Walker, Laura Tingle, James Fallows, George Megalogenis and Prue Goward. <laughs> now then, next Monday, in the wake of the budget and the expected election announcement, Q&A will be in Melbourne with the Assistant Treasurer, Kelly O'Dwyer, her Labor counterpart, Andrew Lee, Greens Treasury spokesman, Adam Bant, Council of Social Services head, Cassandra Goldie, and the head of the executive, I beg your pardon, the chief executive of the Australian Industry Group, Innes Willocks. Until then, good night.